Hello, everyone. So in this last video of this whole course of philosophical beginnings, matter, motion, and the cosmos, we shall end with the cosmology and cosmogony and bit of the idea of the theory of sensations of uh, Leucippus and Democritus, the ancient atomists. So in the last video, we ended by talking about chance and necessity. And I was talking about this, um, my favorite poet, really, one of my favorite poets, which is Stéphane Malarmé, who says, un coup de dé jamais n'abolira Lazare, which basically translates to a throw of dice, never would abolish chance. And so Malarmé we have here, where he says, a throw of dice at any time, even when cast in everlasting circumstances from the depth of a shipwreck, whether the ca chasm, whitish, full tide, frenzied, down a declivity desperately glides on a wing, its own in advance fallen back from a failure to guide its flight, and covering all the outspurts cutting off all the surges, fa far, far within recalls, the shadowed buried deep in the deep veiled by this variant sail to the point of matching the span, with its gaping trowel like the shell of a ship, listing to this side or that. I'll skip all the middle parts, never will abolish chance, yeah? So an amazing poem, actually read it. It's, it's, it's actually like atoms scattered in the void. You know, I was reading it in a very linear way. It's difficult to, to read out this poem, um, but yeah, I made a valiant attempt and maybe a failed attempt, pretty much a failed attempt at explaining this. So now chance is not abolished, right? Necessity is the ruler, everything is by necessity, and chance is not, not abolished, but the throw of dice nevertheless makes chance something that is, um, if we start th thinking about it retrospectively, is something that it does not exist, right? Because it's all determined. But at the moment of the throw of dice, it is something that is going to happen in the future. And this really strict concept of chance and necessity, of infinite possibilities of infinite possibilities, a possibility of possibilities, uh, is what is the, at the base of the at atomic cosmogony, the cosmogony of the atomists, right? So I'll read out again, sorry, from Aristotle, um, the idea of um, the combination of bodies, yeah? The formation of bodies. So, this is from Aristotle, he says, as they, um, which is the atoms, move, they, as they move, they collide and become entangled in such a way as to cling in close contact to one another, but not so as to form one substance of them in reality of any kind, whatever. For it is very simple-minded to suppose that two or more could ever become one. The reason he gives for atoms staying together for a while is the intertwining and mutual hold of the primary bodies. For some of them are angular, some hooked, some concave, some convex, and indeed with countless other differences, so he thinks they cling to each other and stay together until such time as some stronger necessity comes from the surrounding and shakes and scatters them apart. Yeah? So this is the idea of the formation of bodies, right? So what do we have here? We have the notion, oops, everything is going to collapse here. Right, we have the notion that phenomena in general are produced because some of the atoms in this eternal jostling of each other, they don't recoil, right? Because many of them recoil and separate again, but some of them don't recoil. And being of a suitable shape for combination, right? They cling together, they become entangled, and then they generate perceptible bodies. They themselves are really tiny, so imperceptible. By the combination, they generate perceptible bodies. And then this, these perceptible bodies eventually form our cosmos. Now, the formation of the cosmos, there's more to read. Um, so the formation of the cosmos, so we have this from um, yeah. Diogenes Laertes, where he says, uh, Leucippus holds that the whole is infinite, part of it is full and part void. Hence arise innumerable worlds, right? Not cosmos, but cosmoi, right? And are resolved again into these elements. The worlds come into being as follows. 
many bodies of all sorts um, of shapes move by abscission from the infinite into a great void. They come together there and produce a single world. They produce this vortex, right? They produce a single world in which colliding with one another and revolving in all manner of ways, they, began, they begin to separate again, like to like. But when the multitude prevents them from rotating any longer in equilibrium, those that are fine go out towards the surrounding void as if sifted, while the rest abide together and becoming entangled, unite their motions and make a first spherical structure. This structure stands apart like a membrane, which contains in itself all kinds of bodies. And as they whirl around owing to the resistance of the middle, the surrounding membranes become thin while contiguous atoms keep flowing together owing to contact with the world. So you have this world, this vortex, and the ones inside are pulling them inside and there's a bit of a membrane while they abide together and they, there's some resistance, some inertia, if you want to think of it in these, again, anachronistic terms. Uh, and the, the ones inside are being pulled into the vortex, right? The atoms uh, that had been born to the middle abiding together there. Again, the containing membrane is itself increased and the inertia is also increased owing to the attraction of the bodies outside because there are also other things that are attracting them in the other direction. You can think of it as multiple gravity, again, very anachronistic idea, but you know, multiple gravitational pulls that are happening or, or maybe you know, other forces, I don't know. But the forces come from the entangling of atoms. So the atoms getting together are what cause these forces in the first place. So whether you think of it as gravitational, electromagnetic, all of these are, by the way, anachronistic ideas. But whichever force, you know, strong force or weak force you want to think about, what's going on is that, you know, these, these certain combination of atoms start um, exerting these forces on other combination of atoms, right? Earlier, the forces weren't present. Earlier, you know, they were, there was just random movement of atoms and they were move, moving and vibrating. But once they start forming these compounds, you know, they, they start generating a level of attraction uh, and repulsion, or well, not repulsion, it's more of attraction force. So one is attracting something else. The vortex, however, is trying to pull everything inside. So there is, there is a kind of resistance that is happening out here. And as it moves around in the world, it takes anything it touches, right? And the vortex is pulling anything that it can, it, it touches, right? Some of these bodies that get entangled form a structure that is at first moist and muddy, but as they revolve with the whirl of the whole, they dry out and then ignite to form the substance of the heavenly bodies. So that's the cosmogony, right? That's how the world is formed. The inside, the heavier parts, uh, they, they, because the, the, the atoms get much, much closer together, they form things that are moist and heavy and, and then they, they, they fall towards the center. So the weight of the atoms that Aristotle was complaining about, so this weight is not originally part of the atoms. The weight is activated when they get into the vortex, right? When they get into the vortex, they combine together and then they become heavy and the heaviness increases as more combine together. And then that heaviness, uh, due, due to the size and complexity of the compound, then falls towards a center of the vortex, and that's where you have the formation of heavenly bodies. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and another one from Hippolytus, where he says, Democritus holds the same view as Leucippus about the elements, full and void. He spoke as if the things that are were in constant motion in the void, and that there are innumerable worlds which differ in size. In some worlds, there is no sun and moon. In others, they're larger than in our world. And in some more numerous, as I said, you know, this lovely, lovely image, and which at that time was definitely science fiction. Now we know it as, um, you know, sort of science. Well, know as much as we can. Uh, that there are innumerable worlds, and then they don't have just the same model. You know, they're not all modeled according to what we see around us. Some may have more suns and moons. Some may have none. Some may have bigger ones, right? Uh, the intervals between worlds are unequal. They're at different distances, these worlds. Uh, in some parts, there are more worlds. In some parts, there might be more planets, if you want to think of it in terms of planets. In others, fewer. Some parts may have fewer planets. Some are increasing, some at their height, some decreasing. Some, some worlds, some systems, world systems are increasing in size still because they're still being formed. Some of them are decreasing in size because they are now going towards collapse. In some parts, they are arising, in others, falling, right? They're destroyed by collision one with another. That's how they're destroyed, when they collide with one another. There are some worlds devoid of living creatures or plants or any moisture. There are some worlds which have no plants, no moisture, no living beings. 
you know, I really feel that he might be an alien who ca came to Earth, you know, and is trying to tell people this and nobody believes him. And then it was all forgotten because, I mean, we are pretty much in that vision of the world now. This is the vision of the world we have, right? So our cosmos then is one of innumerable cosmoi for there is no limit to atoms in the void and you know a throw of dice doesn't abolish chance so it is unlikely as you know they would say that a single world should arise in the infinite if the, the, there is uh, infinite possibilities and infinite atoms and infinite collisions then why should a single world arise and that one single like the, the idea is it's as impossible that a single world should arise as a single you know ear of corn should grow on a large plane you know this from democritus so so so, so this idea that why should there be just a single world so there are he would say innumerable worlds of different sizes uh, in some, no sun or moon. In other, they are larger. We got that all that from Hippolytus. Um, uh, in in some, there are more than one. So this is th these are all things you know. Like I think this is an extant fragment of Democritus, if I'm not wrong. And they're at irregular distances. There are some flourishing. There are some dying, right? They're, they're, I mean, if you notice, well, I mean, I'm not going to repeat that whole paragraph again, even though I love it very much, right? Um, the, the, the fact that there are no animal or vegetable life. The idea, the, what is important here, is that if you notice, there's no teleological explanation. There's no idea that there is a mind or a god or a, you know, like with Xenophanes, there were you had this theos in the middle, or with um, uh, with the later. Um, um, and Anaxagoras, you had the mind, and with, with Aristotle, who would come after, you again have this idea of there being a telos, you know, a necessity, a, a sort of actuality towards which all these post potentialities are going. Here, there's no teleological explanation. There's no animistic explanation as well. I, like with Thales, there was no soul, right? There's no soul out here which says, oh, I want to form these things or whatever, right? There, there, there is, it's a completely mechanistic, non teleological, evolutionary concept of the world, right? And when we're talking about the formation of the world, we have this idea that from all eternity, there were these infinite number of atoms in different shapes, different sizes, different arrangements, moving about in infinite space with an irregular, aimless motion. Everything is aimless, right? And at irregular distances, as you notice, you know, there's not like a fixed distance between them. And uh, when there is a large interval of space that happens between them, right, this empty space, they might, you know, by collapsing, the, the idea, the vortex, the world that we were talking about, this world of things, this whirlpool, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they pour into that and then you, they form a critical mass. And as they form a critical mass, you know, they, they go, get into this circular, well, in this case, you remember with, um, with Anaxagoras, we had a centrifugal motion. Everything was fleeing away from the center and the universe was expanding. Here, the formation of the cosmos, and, but he still talked about the, uh, the vortex, the formation of the cosmos is a kind of centripetal motion. It's seeking the center, right? It's going towards the center. And this, this centripetal motion of circular motion um, results in the birth of the cosmos. Why? Because all the atoms towards the inside of this uh, centripetal motion at the center of this, uh, this thing are drawn into this general pattern of the world. And um, they're they, they did sort of jostle, they tumble, they perform all kinds of movements inside. They're turning, turning, and turning, and turning in the not widening gyre, in the collapsing gyre, right? And um, at this point, there is a um, there's a cardinal law that we have seen in, in the ancients that the like tends towards like and then acts upon like. So you have this membrane that separates off with some resisting that motion because there are more like atoms, let's say, outside and some falling inside. Right? And because of some commonality, this, the heavier ones fall, and, and, and the compounds that form of the heavier ones fall, right? and um, they get towards the center, the lighter ones are squeezed outwards, Right, and, and, and this is what happens. So the heavier ones get to the inside, the moist tends towards the inside, and the lighter compounds sort of, you know, are, uh, go, go outwards and are squeezed outwards. And um, the, everything happens by this influence of these similar. So there's no actor, and there's no sort of, you know, thing acted upon. There's no sort of agent of, of, of this, this motion, and there's no thing that is affected. It's all interlinked, right? There's an interaction between elements without an external cause. And so the, the world then becomes a, a mechanical thing. It's no longer a living thing. And this is the first time we have this. 
you know, even though matter, for example, for uh, Democritus or for um, the Democritus, I'm saying, for Anaxagoras and for Empedocles was in some ways, you know, inert and you had an external force acting upon them, but you had an external force and that external force was something thinking, right? It was an, an alive thing, an animistic thing. It was a spirit or a soul. There's no soul here. I mean, in fact, they talk about soul atoms. So, so what causes these movements in, in human bodies, if you say that human bodies, but human beings are alive, look, human beings are alive. They're like, well, no. Human beings are also just matter. But what they have is they have these really, really tiny spherical atoms. And the spherical atoms are supposed to be the most subtle and tiny. And then they don't entangle, of course, entangle because they're spherical, but they still like attracts to like. And they form this kind of sphericity. And then they move very fast through the body. And they form a kind of nervous system. And, and this idea of nervous system, you will find later with Epicurus and Lucretius, where, where they talk a bit more about it, where our sensations and our, our, our life itself is these spherical atoms that are roaming about in our body. And there's this description in Lucretia is a very dark one of like somebody dying in which you know uh, these the, the sea soul atoms these spherical atoms slowly leave move out from the limbs so the idea is somebody takes poison and with that poison then you know that there's this dark sort of you know slowly you start losing sensation at the extremities of your body so the idea is the, that the extremities are losing these soul atoms which are then moving out with this breath it's pretty horrifying sorry uh, so, so you know that this idea of um, these soul atoms that cause Life, and these soul atoms cause life through touch again. They, they are not a, they're not a thinking thing. In fact, thought and stuff, we'll talk about that as well, how that comes about. Um, what you have is then this kind of a movement of atoms which causes everything, a complete mechanistic, no longer living movement of atoms through pure combination of chance and necessity, <laughs> which, um, which creates the world. Yeah? No God required, no external mind required, no human intervention required, no human understanding required. In fact, you know, humans are not required in this whole system because it is all happening by contingency, right? And humans come much later. And humans are anyway part of this world. They're trying to understand it, and that's why they're coming up with these theories. But they're a really tiny and unnecessary part of this world. This world was being formed and dissolving, and, and it's happening all over the universe when parts which we humans cannot even reach. So, so you know, the, the, the place of the humans is like we are decentered entirely with Democritus, right? So basically, we have now, without gods, an undesigned combination of atoms subject to apparently random motion, right, which is random to us humans, but perhaps not random in the sense that the randomness is just a very subtle form of necessity and determinism of these atoms, which happen to take certain directions in this particular, in this completely mechanical compulsion, and they formed these worlds. These form, they formed these innumerable cosmoi. They formed these number of worlds which, which are spread apart at irregular distances. We don't even know about most of them. In fact, even now, uh, we don't really know of any other worlds that have life. Uh, in fact, there are other worlds that don't have life, that don't have, um, you know, um, suns and moons, and they don't have water or moisture, because any kind of world can be formed. Like, there is, and that's why a throw of dice doesn't abolish chance, you know, because any kind of world could have come about. You know, this, this world is created by necessity, yes, but, but um, the point is that there is nothing that dictates that, that this is what will happen in this world, or this is what will happen in that world. Rather, it's the the, the mechanical combination of atoms and the kind of atoms and the number of atoms that are present in that area that will determine the formation, formation of that cosmos and this area, formation of this cosmos. In fact, we can't even talk about the cosmos anymore. We have to always talk about cosmoi. We always have to talk about plural cosmoi, right? Because there are many of them. So now to now come back to Earth, right? To come back to our world, what do we have here? We have we we have life we have humans we are we as humans are trying to understand this world which in many ways sort of escapes our understanding because of our the unsubtlety really or the, or the the limitedness of our human understanding though we are trying to increase it um so how what are we formed of you know so for the atomists we are not anything special we don't have this special mind like with anaxagoras you know you have this mind everywhere but all living things have parts of mind inside them you know a bit of a pythagorean notion which still remained with anaxagoras you know? uh, but with uh, with the atomists now even that is gone 
What are we composed of? We are composed of atoms in certain combinations. And the fact that we seem to self-move is because a certain kind of atoms are inside us and they have you know, trapped inside us for whatever reason, um, they, they move very fast throughout our bodies and form a kind of nervous system which uh, allows us movement and sensation in our body. And this movement is activated by touch. In fact, everything in the atomist world is activated by touch because everything is an atom or a void. So in the void, it moves in empty space. When it collides with another atom, it activates it in some way, you know, it, it, it changes it. it, either moves it, they, they, they sort of, you know, jostle and they, they are scattered apart or they collide and they collapse. And then there's also this, this other notion of force, right? The force of attraction that is very, very important for the atomists. So perhaps there is a notion of force, but that force is also activated by the interaction of atoms. It's an emergent property, in fact. If you want to think in terms of properties, it's not a property that exists without the atoms. The atoms are not attracting sitting there by themselves. In fact, the property emerges only when like atoms get together. When unlike atoms get together, they might get stuck, entangled, or repulsed. But when like atoms get together, they get attracted. There is an attractive force that is formed between them, and which is why these spherical atoms, these soul atoms, even though they don't entangle, they still stick together. Why do they stick together? Because of this like attracts to like, because this, this attractive force gets activated, is an emergent property that gets activated between them. Right? And so uh, these tiny spherical atoms, the soul is understood as these tiny spherical atoms, which are spread throughout the body. And uh, the mind, in some way, if, uh, if we think of it, the mind here, I think the mind was sort of as being here, like at the center of the body. Uh, the mind is something that is a concentration of soul atoms. So here they concentrate and they move about. And then, and then you have the soul atoms traveling everywhere and bringing information to the mind. And the thought process then is whenever the mind atoms or soul atoms are set in motion from the action from the outside, right? So they have to be activated from outside. So when I, for example, when I see something, I hear something, all the sensations are basically external atoms acting upon my internal soul atoms on my nervous system uh, and activating them and making them see or feel. In fact, he had a um, concept of um, the feeling of sense, uh, of, of sense organs and of sense impressions. So you have atoms from outside that leave impressions on our, on our surface, and the, the surface is what is touched by these soul atoms, which are moving very fast, as I said, throughout. And those sensations then are taken to our mind, and then we form thoughts. In fact, it, it is actually amazingly modern. And the, the differences in sensation, again, are due to the size and shape of atoms interacting with a particular configuration of atoms. So I think one of the examples given uh, later, uh, I forgot whom by now, um, is that like, imagine you, you have something first sweet, right? So then what happens is that the sweet, I think, are, are sort of rounder at atoms. And then the, 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 there are other atoms which are bitter. And, 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 and then so if you have something after that, the, if the taste of the other thing that you have will be changed or, or will be changed for you in that particular circumstance. And that's a very good example of emergent property. It's a temporary emergent property, right, in which you have certain atoms in your, in your mouth which are activated by the action of um, some other atoms, or, or you have these sharp atoms, I think the bitter atoms or the, the spicy atoms, the sharp ones which, which hurt your tongue, but your tongue itself can feel it because it has certain, uh, certain atoms there that can feel that sharpness. While you know, the other parts of the body may not feel it in the same way because the interaction is limited, because the kind of atoms that meets them is different, right? So it's all about a particular configuration of atoms meeting another configuration of atoms. And um, let me see if I can find something on sensation out here. Um, sensation and thought, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Aristotle, as he says, um, they believe that all perception is by touch. 
uh, that perception and thought arise when images enter from outside, neither occurs to anybody without uh, an image impinging. So images occur, come from outside, you know, and they hit our, in our eyes, let's say, we have, uh, we have these uh, sense organs which can take in impressions, and these impressions are these images coming in. In fact, this is one of the weirder theories of these idola or these effluences, which are explained by um, Epicurus and Lucretius as well later on, that, that sort of come and touch these sense organs and these effluences. In fact, in book four in Lucretius, you have you know, these effluences that, that he uses to critique the idea of love. Um, anyway, let's not go into all that. Um, so so um, you have this idea of uh, effluences entering uh, our, our eyes and, and, and leaving sense impressions. And these sense, sense impressions then traveling inside and forming memories as well. So, so memories are also, in fact, what are memories? Memories are also little impressions left by atoms. And, and, and that's why they, they disappear when we die. You know, so these, these memories sort of disintegrate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so the visual image does not um, arise directly in the pupil, but the air between the eye and the object of sight is contracted and stamped by the object seen and the seer. Um, and there is an effluence from everything. In fact, uh, let me see. So this one doesn't have that many quotes. I mean, the other book does, but uh, we, we are also running out of time, so I'll, I'll you know, not, not continue so far. It's, it's actually, I, f I feel it's a real, real tragedy that we don't have, you know, um, more of these... 60, more than 60 works that he wrote. Um, and we have something from Epicurus where he talks about um, language, or maybe it is just Lucretius now I'm forgetting. I'm also, I also sort of tend to mix them because I've been reading all of them together, uh, um, in which you know, they talk about the origin of language and the origin of language from being like basic sounds. Is, you know, the point is that they, they come up with the, the, what I really th think is quite impressive about the atomists is that they come up with explanations which are you know, they, they are the strictest of the natural, natural philosophers, actually. You know, they don't take things for granted at all, you know, including the idea of self-movement and the soul and the mind and, you know, um, the, the formation of the world and the fact of a single world. You know, the humans are decentered. Humans are made, you know, just one of the different matters. Um, our earth is decentered. Our sun is decentered. The sun is also not necessary. There's nothing that is necessary and everything is necessary. You know, and, the, and then they take the notion of chance and necessity to as much sort of like to whatever distance they could, right? And as far as they could. And they take um, the notion of um, motion and change as far as they can. They exclude any external actor. And, and that's something that you will, you will see with uh, Epicurus and Lucretius. And perhaps that's why we lost most of their works. Because um, in, the, in the history of the world, we've had this desire, really, to have uh, you know, a great master control things, um, or great masters, maybe, earlier. But a great master control things, as we had with Hesiod and Zeus. So we, we want this, you know, one Zeus who eats up metis and controls everything. While with Leucippus and Democritus, there's no requirement even, you know. There's just, they're, they're not necessary, so they are just not there. So they're, they're, they're completely sort of, it's, it becomes a completely natural atomistic motion. And this, I think, is, is the greatest influence on, um, on science, on the history of thought, really. And, um, and, and um, generally on, on, on the world. And I did not sort of read out anything about the ethics, but you know most of the fragments that we have um, are on ethics from this. Um, and and these, the ethics of Democritus is something that, in fact, uh, later influenced um, Epicurus and Lucretius as well. And um, you have this idea of a temperate enjoyment, commensurate life, uh, and, 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 um, and, and in fact, you can't, unlike with the, with the Stoics um, and, and a lot of other philosophers, you can't really necessarily connect immediately the notion of ethics to um, and the ethics and politics, really, to, to their uh, physics. Um, with with the with the with um, the atomists, but it's still there because the point is that it's a chance life that we have gotten by chance. It's a chance world, and so we should make the best of it. We should live it to our best, and and that's the Epicureanism, you know, without sort of you know waiting for a master to rescue us because there is no master to rescue us. There is no sort of you know uh, world god or master here in in the atomist system. 
and, uh, and and in that sense, you know, Democritus is too, truly democratic. It's he's, you know, if you forgive me that pun, we have moved from the annexes, you know, all the lords that we had to a demos, you know, to the people and to the idea of, you know, a commensurate life, a good life uh, that can be lived with, um, by ourselves without, you know, expecting a, a, a master god to control everything. So, you know, the history of ideas, as I said, atomism is, in that sense, pretty central. Now, they were much critiqued. So immediately after by Plato and Aristotle, and then later, you know, by, by the Stoics, and then later in the history of philosophy, as I said, they are, they are it's lost, but they're also revived. And this, this resurrection, uh, if you let me use a religious term out here, um, this, this uh, re sort of bringing of, of the atomist is something that is, um, uh, that is, I think, one of the most important sort of uh, steps we took really in the history of philosophy. And I'm really glad that they were not completely lost. And I'm really glad that uh, they um, did form, um, they do form part of our history of ideas in such a strong way. Um, so yeah, this is the end of this course, Matter, Motion and the Cosmos. I hope you um, did enjoy it and this led you to um, form some interest in looking at ancient ideas, ancient theories, and also to some interest in the history of ideas, which I think is um, a, a, a very sort of interesting and rich domain. A lot has been done, as you can see, you know, 2,500 years ago, people were already commenting on these. But um, that doesn't mean that, you know, the richness of this is lost or everything is explored, as uh, Leucippus and Democritus would have said, you know, um, infinite possibilities in, with infinite atoms and infinite combinations and dissolutions. So, there is still sort of a lot to be explored, a lot of work to be done, and um, there is no end to it. There's no telos to it. So um, we do it for as much time as we have here and uh, make the best of it. Thank you. <laughs>